Chapter Twenty One of Gunsight Pass: How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hold Up. To Sanders, working on Afternoon Tower at Jackpot Number Three, the lean, tan driller in charge of operations was wise with an uncanny knowledge the newcomer could not fathom. For eight hours at a stretch he stood on the platform and watched a greasy cable go slipping into the earth. Every quiver of it, every motion of the big walking beam, every kick of the engine told him what was taking place down that narrow pipe two thousand feet below the surface. He knew when the tools were in clay and had become gummed up. He could tell just when the drill had cut into hard rock at an acute angle and was running out of the perpendicular to follow the softer stratum. His judgment appeared infallible as to whether he ought to send down a reamer to straighten the kink. All Dave knew was that a string of tools far underground was jerking up and down monotonously. This spelt romance to Jed Burns, superintendent of operations, though he would never have admitted it. He was a bachelor, always would be one, hard-working, hard-drinking, at odd times a plunging gambler. He lived for nothing but oil and the atmosphere of oil fields. From one boom to another he drifted, as inevitably as the gamblers, grafters, and organizers of fake companies. Several times he had made fortunes, but it was impossible for him to stay rich. He was always ready to back a drilling proposition that looked promising, and no independent speculator can continue to wildcat without going broke. He was sifting sand through his fingers when Dave came on tower the day after the flood. To Bob Hart, present as Crawford's personal representative, he expressed an opinion. Right soon now or never, sand tastes, feels, looks, and smells like oil. But you can't ever be sure. An oil prospect is like a woman. She will or she won't. You never can tell which. Then, if she does, she's liable to change her mind. Dave sniffed the pleasing, pungent odor of the crude oil sands. His friend had told him that Crawford's fate hung in the balance. Unless oil flowed very soon in paying quantities, he was a ruined man. The control of the jackpot properties would probably pass into the hands of steelmen. The cattlemen would even lose the ranches which had been the substantial basis of his earlier prosperity. Everybody working on the jackpot felt the excitement as the drill began to sink into the oil-bearing sands. Most of the men owned stock in the company. Moreover, they were getting a bonus for their services and had been promised an extra one if number three struck oil in paying quantities before Steelman's crew did. Even to an outsider there is a fascination in an oil well. It is as absorbing to the drillers as a girl's mind is to her hopeful lover day found it impossible to escape the contagion of this moreover he had ten thousand shares in the jackpot stock turned over to him out of the treasury supply by the board of directors in recognition of services which they did not care to specify in the resolution which authorized the transfer at first he had refused to accept this but bob hart had put the matter to him in such a light that he changed his mind the oil business pays big for expert advice, no matter whether it's legal or technical. What you did was worth fifty times what the board voted you. If we make a big strike, you've saved the company. If we don't, the stock's not worth a plug nickel anyhow. You've earned what we voted you. Hang on to it, Dave. Dave had thanked the board and put the stock in his pocket. Now he felt himself drawn into the drama represented by the thumping engine which continued day and night. After his shift was over, he rode to town with Bob behind his team of wild broncos. Got to look for an engineer for the night tower, Hart explained as he drew up in front of the gusher saloon. Come in with me. It's some gambling hell, if you ask me. The place hummed with the turbulent life that drifts to every wild frontier on the boom. Faro dealers from the Klondike, poker dealers from Nome, roulette croupiers from Leadville were all here to reap the rich harvest to be made from investors, field workers, and operators. Smooth grafters with stock and worthless companies for sale circulated in and out with blueprints and whispered inside information. The men who were ranged in front of the bar, behind which half a dozen attendants in white aprons busily waited on their wants, 
usually talked oil and nothing but oil. Today they had another theme. The same subject engrossed the group scattered here and there throughout the large hall. In the rear of the room were the faro layouts, the roulette wheels, and the poker players. Around each of these the shifting crowd surged. Mexicans, Chinese, and even Indians brushed shoulders with white men of many sorts and conditions. The white-faced professional gambler was in evidence, winning the money of big brown men in miners' boots and corduroys. The betting was wild and extravagant, for the spirit of the speculator had carried away the cool judgment of most of these men. They had seen a barber become a millionaire in a day, because the company in which he had plunged had struck a gusher. They had seen the same man borrow five dollars three months later to carry him over until he got a job. Riches were pouring out of the ground for the gambler who would take a chance. Thrift was a much discredited virtue in Malapi. The one unforgivable vice was to be a piker. Bob found his man at a faro table. While the cards were being shuffled, he engaged him to come out next evening to the jackpot properties. As soon as the dealer began to slide the cards out of the case, the attention of the engineer went back to his bets. While Dave was standing close to the wall, ready to leave as soon as Bob returned to him, he caught sight of an old acquaintance. Steve Russell was playing stud poker at a table a few feet from him. The cowpuncher looked up and waved his hand. "'See you in a minute, Dave,' he called, and as soon as the pot had been won, he said to the man shuffling the cards, "'Deal me out this hand.' He rose, stepped across to Sanders, and shook hands with a strong grip. "'You darned old son of a gun! I'm sure glad to see you. Heard you was back. Say, you certainly been going some. Suits me I never did like either Doug or Miller a whole lot. Doug's one sure enough bad man, and Miller's a tin-horn would-be. What you did to both of em was a plenty. But keep your eye peeled, old-timer. Miller's where he belongs again, but Doug's still on the range, and you can bet he's seeing red these days.' He'll gun you if he gets half a chance. Yes, said Dave evenly. You don't figure to let yourself get caught again without a six-shooter. Steve put this statement with the rising inflection. No. That's right. Don't let him get the drop on you. He's sudden death with a gun. Bob joined him. After a moment's conversation, Russell drew them to a corner of the room that for the moment was almost deserted. Say, you heard the news, Bob? I could tell you that better after I know what it is, returned Hart with a grin. The stage was held up at Cottonwood Bend and robbed of seventeen thousand dollars. The driver was killed. When? This morning. They tried to keep it quiet, but it leaked out. Whose money was it? Brad Steelman's payroll and a shipment of gold for the bank. Any idea who did it? Steve showed embarrassment. "'Why, no, I ain't, if that's what you mean. "'Well, anybody else? "'That's what I want to tell you. Two men were in the job. "'They're whispering that M. Crawford was one. "'Crawford? "'Some of Steelman's fine work in that rumor, I bet. "'He's crazy if he thinks he can get away with that. "'That's plumb foolish talk. "'What evidence does he claim?' demanded Hart. "'M. deposited ten thousand with the First National "'to pay off a note he owed the bank.' rode into town right straight to the bank two hours after the stage got in then too seems one of the hold-ups called the other one crawford the plant dave said promptly looks like bob's voice was rich with sarcasm i don't reckon the other one rose up his hind legs and said i'm bob hart did he they claim the second man was dave here hm what time you say this hold-up took place uh, must have been about eleven Let's Dave out. He was fifteen miles away, and we can prove it by at least six witnesses. Good. I reckon M can put in an alibi, too. I'll bet he can, Hart promised this with conviction. Trouble is, they say they've got witnesses to show M was traveling toward the bend half an hour before the hold-up. Art Johnson and Clem Purdy met him while they was on their way to town. Was Crawford alone? He was then, yep. Anyone might have been there. You might. I might. I don't prove a thing. Hell, I know M. Crawford's not mixed up in any hold-up, let alone damned cowardly murder. You don't need to tell me that. Point is that evidence is piling up. 
where did em get the ten thousand to pay the bank two days ago he was trying to increase the loan the first national had made him dave spoke i don't know where he got it but unless he's a born fool and nobody ever claimed that of crawford he wouldn't take the money straight to the bank after he had held up the stage and killed the driver that's a strong point in his favor if he can show where he got the ten thousand amended russell and of course he can and where he spent that two hours after the hold-up before he came to town that'll have to be explained too said bob oh em he'll be able to explain that all right decided steve cheerfully where is crawford now asked dave he hasn't been arrested has he not yet but he's being watched soon as he showed up at the bank the sheriff asked to look at his six-shooter two cartridges had been fired one of the passengers on the stage told me two shots was fired from a six-gun by the boss hold-up the second one killed old tim harrigan did they accuse crawford of the killing not directly he was asked to explain i ain't heard what his story was we better go to his house and talk with him suggested hart maybe he can give us as good an alibi as you dave you and i will go straight there decided sanders steve get three saddle horses we'll ride out to the bend and see what we can learn on the ground i'll cash my chips get the bronx and meet you lads at crawford's said russell promptly End of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Number Three Comes In. Joyce opened the door to the knock of the young men. At sight of them, her face lit. Oh, I'm so glad you've come, she cried, tears in her voice. She caught her hands together in a convulsive little gesture. Isn't it dreadful? i've been afraid all the time that something awful would happen and now it has don't you worry miss joyce bob told her cheerfully we ain't gonna let anything happen to your pa we aim to get busy right away and run this thing down looks like a frame up if it is you bet you will get at the truth will you can you she turned to dave in appeal eyes star-like in a face that was a white and shining oval in the semi-darkness we'll try he said simply something in the way he said it in the quiet reticence of his promise sent courage flowing to her heart she had called on him once before and he had answered splendidly and recklessly where's mr crawford asked bob he's in the sitting-room come right in her father was sitting in a big chair one leg thrown carelessly over the arm he was smoking a cigar composedly come in boys he called reckon you've heard that i'm a stage rustler and a murderer joyce cried out at this the wide mobile mouth trembling just now at the gusher said bob they didn't arrest you not yet they're watching the house sit down and i'll tell it to you he had gone out to see a homesteader about doing some work for him on the way he had met johnson and purdy near the bend just before he had turned up a draw leading to the place in the hills owned by the man whom he wanted to see two hours had been spent riding to the little valley where the nestor had built his corrals and his log house and when crawford arrived neither he nor his wife was at home he returned to the road without having met a soul since he had left it and from there jogged on back to town on the way he had fired twice at a rattlesnake you never reached the bend then at all said dave no but i can't prove i didn't the old cattleman looked at the end of his cigar thoughtfully nor can't i prove i went out to dick green's place in that three four hours not accounted for anyhow you can show where you got the ten thousand dollars you paid the bank said bob hopefully a moment of silence then crawford spoke no son i can't tell that either faint and breathless with suspense joyce looked at her father with dilated eyes why not because the money was loaned to me on those conditions but but don't you see dad if you don't tell that they'll think i'm guilty well i reckon they'll have to think it joy steady gray eyes looked straight into the brown ones of the girl 
I've been in this country boy and man for most fifty years. Anyone that's willing to think me a cold-blooded murderer at this date, why, he's welcome to hold any opinion he pleases. I don't give a damn what he thinks. But we've got to prove. No, we haven't. They've got to do the proving. The law holds me innocent till I'm found guilty. But you don't aim to keep still and let a lot of miscreants blacking your good name, suggested Hart. You bet I don't, Bob, but I reckon I'll not break my word to a friend either, especially under the circumstances this money was loaned. He'll release you when he understands, cried Joyce. Don't bank on that, honey, Crawford said slowly. You ain't to mention this. I'm telling you three private. He can't come out and tell that he let me have the money. Understand? You don't any of you know a thing about how I come by that ten thousand. I refuse to answer questions about that money. That's my business. Oh, but, Dad, you can't do that. You'll have to give an explanation. You'll have to... The best explanation I can give, Joy, is to find out who held up the stage and killed Tim Harrigan. It's the only one that'll satisfy me. It's the only one that will satisfy my friends. That's true, said Sanders. Steve Russell's bringing horses, said Bob. We'll ride out to the bend tonight and be ready for business there at the first streak of light. Must be some trail left by the hold-ups. Crawford shook his head. Probably not. Applegate had a posse out there right away. You know Applegate. He'd blunder if he had a chance. His boys have milled all over the place and destroyed any trail that was left. We'll go out anyhow, Dave and Steve and I won't do any harm we're liable to discover something don't you reckon maybe so who's that knocking on the door joy someone was rapping on the front door imperatively the girl opened it to let into the hall a man in greasy overalls where's mr crawford he demanded excitedly here in the sitting room what's wrong wrong not a thing he talked as he followed joyce to the door of the room except that number three's come in the biggest gusher I ever see. She's knocked the whole superstructure galley west, and she's rip raring to beat the Dutch. Emerson Crawford leaped to his feet, for once visibly excited. What? he demanded. What's that? Just like I say, the oil's spouting up a hundred feet like a fan. Before morning, the sump holes will be full, and she'll be running all over the prairie. Burns sent you? Yep. Says for you to get men and teams and scrapers and gunny sacks and heavy timbers out there right away. Many as you can sand. Crawford turned to Bob, his face aglow. Your job, Bob. Spread the news. Rustle up everybody you can get. Arrange with the railroad grade contractor to let us have all his men, teams, and scrapers till we get her hog-tied and harnessed. Big wages and we'll feed the whole outfit free. Hire anybody you can find. Buy a couple of hundred shovels and send them out to number three. Get Robinson to move his tent restaurant out there. Hart nodded. What about this job at the band? He asked in a low voice. Dave and I'll tend to that. You hump on the jackpot job. Sons, we're rich, all three of us. Point is, keep from losing that crude on the prairie. Keep three shifts going till she's under control. Well, we can't do anything at the bend till morning, said Dave. We better put the night in helping Bob. Sure, we've got to get all Malappy busy. A dozen businessmen have got to come down and open up their stores so as we can get supplies, agreed Emerson. Joyce, her face flushed and eager, broke in. Ring the fire bell. That's the quickest way. Sure enough, you got a hate on your shoulders. Dave, you attend to that. Bob, hit the dust for the big saloons and gather men. I'll see O'Connor about the railroad outfit. Then I'll come down to the firehouse and talk to the crowd. We'll wake this old town up tonight, sons. What about me? asked the messenger. You go back and tell Jed to hold the fort till Hart and his material arrives. Outside, they met Russell riding down the road, two saddled horses following. With a word of explanation, they helped themselves to his mounts while he stared after them in surprise. "'I'll be doggoned if they all ain't three gents in a hurry,' he murmured to the breezes of the night. "'Well, seeing as I've been held up, I reckon I'll have to walk back while the horse thieves ride.' Five minutes later the fire-bell clanged out its call to Malappy. 
from roadside tent and gambling hall, from houses and campfires, men and women poured into the streets. For Malapi was a shell town, tightly packed and inflammable, likely to go up in smoke whenever a fire should get beyond control of the volunteer company. Almost in less time than it takes to tell it, the square was packed with hundreds of lightly clad people and other hundreds just emerging from the night life of the place. The clangor of the bell died away, but the firemen did not run out the hose and bucket cart. The man tugging the rope had told them why he was summoning the citizens. "'Someone's got to go out and explain to the crowd,' said the fire chief to Dave. "'If you know about this strike, you'll have to tell the boys.' "'Crawford said he'd talk,' answered Sanders. "'He ain't here. It's up to you. Go ahead. Just tell him why you rang the bell.' Dave found himself pushed forward to the steps of the courthouse a few yards away. He had never before attempted to speak in public, and he had a queer dry tightening of the throat. But as soon as he began to talk, the words he wanted came easily enough. "'Jackpot number three has come in a big gusher,' he said, lifting his voice so that it would carry to the edge of the crowd. Hundreds of men in the crowd owned stock in the jackpot properties, at Dave's words, a roar went up into the night. Men shouted, danced, or merrily smiled, according to their temperament. Presently, the thirst for news dominated the enthusiasm. Gradually, the uproar was stilled. Again, Dave's voice rang out, clear as the bell he had been tolling. The report is that it's one of the biggest strikes ever known in the state. The derrick has been knocked to pieces and the oil shooting into the air a hundred feet. A second great shout drowned his words. This was an oil crowd. It dreamed oil, talked oil, thought oil, prayed for oil. A stranger in the town was likely to feel at first that the place was oil mad. What else can be said of a town with derricks built through its front porches and even the graveyard leased to a drilling company? The sump holes are filling, went on Sanders. Soon the oil will be running to waste on the prairie. We need men, teams, tools, wagons, hundreds of slickers, tents, beds, grub. The wages will be one fifty a day more than the run of wages in the camp until the emergency has been met, and Emerson Crawford will board all the volunteers who come out to dig. The speaker was lost again, this time in a buzz of voices of excited men, but out of the hubbub Dave's shout became heard. All the owners of teams and tools... All the dealers in hardware and groceries are asked to step to the right-hand side of the crowd for a talk with Mr. Crawford. Men willing to work till the gusher is under control, please meet Bob Hart in front of the firehouse. I'll see any cooks and restaurant men alive to a chance to make money fast. Right here at the steps. Good medicine, son, boomed Emerson Crawford, slapping him on the shoulder. Didn't know you was an orator, but you sure got this crowd going. Bob here yet? Yes, I saw him a minute ago in the crowd. Sorry I had to make promises for you, but the fire chief wouldn't let me keep the crowd waiting. Someone had to talk. Suits me. I'll run you for Congress one of these days. Then, I'll send the grocery men over to you. Tell them to get the grub out tonight. If the restaurant men don't buy it, I'll run my own chuck wagon outfit. See you later, Dave. For the next twenty-four hours, there was no night in Malapi. Streets were filled with shoutings, hurried footfalls, the creaking of wagons, and the thud of galloping horses. Stores were lit up and filled with buyers. For once the gusher and the oil pool and other resorts held small attractions for the crowds. The town was moving out to see the big new discovery that was to revolutionize its fortunes with the opening of a new and tremendously rich field. Every ancient rig available was pressed into service to haul men or supplies out to the jackpot location. Scarcely a minute passed after the time that the first team took the road without a loaded wagon packed to the sideboards moving along the dusty road into the darkness of the desert. Three travelers on horseback rode in the opposite direction. Their destination was Cottonwood Bend. Two of them were Emerson Crawford and David Sanders. The third was an oil prospector who had been a passenger on the stage when it was robbed. End of chapter 22
Chapter 23 of Gunside Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gusher Jackpot number three had come in with a roar that shook the earth for half a mile. Deep below the surface, there was a hiss and a crackle, the shock of rendering strata given way to the pressure of the oil pool. From long experience as a driller, jed burns knew what was coming he swept his crew back from the platform and none too soon to escape disaster they were still flying across the prairie when the crown box catapulted into the sky and the whole drilling superstructure toppled over rocks clay and sand were hurled into the air to come down in a shower that bombarded everything within a radius of several hundred yards the landscape next moment was drenched in black petroleum the fine particles of it filled the air, sprayed the cactus and the greasewood. Rivulets of the viscid stuff began to gather in depressions and to flow in gathering volume as tributaries joined the stream into the sump holes prepared for it. The pungent odor of crude oil, as well as the touch and the taste of it, penetrated the atmosphere. Burns counted noses and discovered that one of his crew had been injured by falling rocks or beams. He knew that his men could not possibly cope with this geyser on a spree. It was a big strike, the biggest in the history of the district, and to control the flow of the gusher would necessitate tremendous efforts on a wholesale plan. One of his men he sent into Malapi on horseback with a hurry-up call to Emerson Crawford, president of the company, for tools, machinery, men, and teams. The others he put to salvaging the engine and accessories and to throwing up an earth dike around the sump hole as a barrier against the escaping crude. All through the night he fought impotently against this giant that had burst loose from its prison two thousand feet below the surface of the earth. With the first faint streaks of day, men came galloping across the desert to the jackpot. They came at first on horseback, singly, and later by twos and threes. A buckboard appeared on the horizon, the driver leaning forward as he urged on his team. Heart, decided the driller, and come in hell for leather. Other teams followed, buggies, surreys, light wagons, farm wagons, and at last heavy-laden lumber wagons. Business in Malapi was shot to pieces, as one merchant expressed it. Everybody who could possibly get away was out to see the big gusher there was an immediate stampede to make locations in the territory adjacent the wildcatter flourished companies were formed in ten minutes and the stock subscribed for in half an hour from the boot black at the hotel to the banker everybody wanted stock and every company drilling within a reasonable distance of jackpot number three many legitimate corporations appeared on the books of the secretary of state and along with these were scores of frauds intending only to gull the small investor and separate him from his money. Saloons and gambling houses, which did business with such childlike candor and stridency, became offices for the sale and exchange of stock. The boom at Malapi got its second wind. Workmen, investors, capitalists, and crooks poured in to take advantage of the inflation brought about by the new strike in a hitherto unknown field for the fame of jackpot number three had spread wide the production guesses ranged all the way from ten to fifty thousand barrels a day most of which was still going to waste on the desert for burns and hart had not yet gained control over the flow though an army of men in overalls and slickers fought the gusher night and day the flow never ceased for a moment the well steadily spouted a stream of black liquid into the air from the subterranean chamber into which the underground lake poured the attack had two objectives the first was to check the outrush of the oil the second was to save the wealth emerging from the mouth of the well and streaming over the lip of the reservoir to the sandy desert a crew of men divided into three shifts worked with pick shovel and scraper to dig a second and a third sump hole the dirt from the excavation was dumped at the edge of the working to build a dam for the fluid sacks filled with wet sand reinforced this dirt meanwhile the oil boiled up in the lake and flowed over its edges in streams 
as soon as the second reservoir was ready the tarry stuff was siphoned into it from the original sump hole by the time this was full a third pool was finished and into it the overflow was diverted but in spite of the great effort made to save the product of the gusher the sands absorbed many thousands of dollars worth of petroleum this end of the work was under the direction of bob hart for ten days he did not take off his clothes when he slept it was in catnaps an hour snatched now and again from the fight with the rising tide of wealth that threatened to engulf its owners he was unshaven unbathed his clothes slimy with tar and grease he ate on the job coffee beans bacon cornbread whatever the cook's flunkies brought him and did not know what he was eating gaunt and dominating with crisp decision and yet unfailing good humor he bossed the gangs under him and led them into the fight holding them at it till flesh and blood revolted with weariness of such stuff is the true outdoor westerner made he may drop in his tracks from exhaustion after the emergency has been met but so long as the call for action lasts he will stick to the finish at the other end jed burns commanded one after another he tried all the devices he had known to succeed in capping or checking other gushers the flow was so continuous and powerful that none of these were effective some wells flow in jets they hurl out the oil die down like a geyser and presently have another hemorrhage jackpot number three did not pulse as a cut artery does its output was steady as the flow of water in a pipe the heavy timbers with which he tried to stop up the outlet were hurled aside like straws. He could not check the flow long enough to get control. On the evening of the tenth day, Burns put in the cork. He made elaborate preparations in advance and assigned his force to the posts where they were to work. A string of eight-inch pipe sixty feet long was slid forward and derricked over the stream above this a large number of steel rails borrowed from the incoming road were lashed to the pipe to prevent it from snapping the pipe had been fitted with valves of various sizes after it had been fastened to the well's casing these were gradually reduced to check the flow without causing a blowout in the pipeline six hours later a metropolitan newspaper carried the headline big gusher harnessed after wild rampage Jackpot number three at Malapi tamed. Long battle ended. End of chapter twenty three. Chapter twenty four of Gunside Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shorty. It was a surprise to Dave to discover that the horse Steve had got for him was his own old favorite, Chiquito. The Pinto knew him. He tested this by putting him through some of his old tricks. The horse refused to dance or play dead, but at the word of command his right foreleg came up to shake hands. He nuzzled his silky nose against the coat of his master, just as in the days of old. Crawford rode a bay larger than a bronco. The oil prospector was astride a rangy roan. He was no horseman, but as a perpetual motion conversationalist, the old wildcatter broke records. He was a short barrel of a man with small eyes set close together, and he made a figure of fun perched high up in the saddle. But he permitted no difficulties of travel to interfere with his monologue the boss hold up was no glad hand artist he explained he was a sure enough sulky devil though of course we couldn't see his face behind the mask blue mask it was made out a bandana handkerchief well right away i knew something was liable to pop for old harrigan scared to death kept a goin just the same maybe he hadn't sense enough to stop as the fellow says maybe he didn't want to bang bang i reckon tim was dead before he hit the ground they lined us up but they didn't take a thing except the gold and one chicago fellow's watch then they cut the harness and pint for the hills how do you know they made for the hills asked dave well they naturally would anyhow they lit out round the bend i hadn't lost em none and i wasn't lookin to see where they went not in this year of our lord i'm right careless at times but not enough so to make inquiries of road agents when they're red from killin 
I've been told I got no terminal facilities of speech, but it's a fact I didn't chirp from start to finish of the hold-up. I was plum reticent. Light sifted into the sky. The riders saw the colors change in the desert dawn. The hilltops below them were veiled in a silver-blue mist. Far away, Malapi rose out of the cauldron, its cheapness for once touched to a moment of beauty and significance. In that glorified sunrise, it might have been a jeweled city of dreams. The prospector's words flowed on. Crystal dawns might come and go, succeeding mist scarfs of rose and lilac, but a great poet has said that speech is silver. No, sir, when a man has got the drop on me, I don't aim to argue with him, not none. Tim Harrigan had notions, different here. I've done some rough housing. When a guy puts up his dukes, I'm there. Once down in Sonora, I slammed a fellow so hard he woke up among strangers. Fact. I don't make claims, but up at Carbondale, they say I'm some rip snorter when I get going good. I'm quiet. I don't go around with a chip on my shoulder. It's the quiet boys you want to look out for. Am I right? Crawford gave a little snort of laughter and covered it hastily with a cough. "'You know it,' went on the quiet man, who was a rip-snorter when he got going. "'In regards to that, I'll say my observation is that when you meet a small man with a steady gray eye, it don't do a bit of harm to spend a lot of time leaving him alone. He may be good-natured, but he won't stand no devil and take it from me.' The small man with the gray eye eased himself in the saddle and moistened his tongue for a fresh start. But I'm not one of these foolhardy idiots who have to have wooden suits made for them because they don't know when to stay mum. You cattlemen have lived a quiet life in the hills, but I've been right where the tough ones crowd for years. I'll tell you there's a time to talk and a time to keep still, as the old saying is. Yes, agreed Crawford. Another thing. I got an instinct that tells me when folks are interested in what I say, I've seen talkers that went right on boring people and never caught on. They'd talk your arm off without getting wise to it that you'd a had a plenty. That kind of talker ain't fit for nothing but to wrangle Mary's little lamb way off from every human being. In front of the riders, a group of cottonwoods lifted their branches at a sharp bend in the road. Just before they reached this turn, a bridge crossed a dry, irrigating lateral. After Harrigan had been shot, I came to the ditch for some water, but she was dry as a whistle. Ever notice how things are that way? A fellow wants water, none there. It's raining rivers, the ditch is running strong. There's a sermon for a preacher, said the prospector. The cattleman nodded to Dave. I noticed she was dry when I crossed higher up on my way out, but she was full up with water when I saw her after I had been up to Dick Grain's. Funny, commented Sanders. Nobody would want water to irrigate at this season. Who turned the water in, and why? Beats me, answered Crawford. But it don't worry me any. I got troubles of my own. They reached the cottonwoods, and the oil prospector pointed out to them just where the stage had been when the bandits first appeared. He showed them the bushes from behind which the robbers had stepped, the place occupied by the passengers after they had been lined up, and the course taken by the hold-ups after the robbery. The road ran up a long, slow incline to the bend, which was the crest of the hill. Beyond it, the wheel tracks went down again with a sharp dip. The stage had been stopped just beyond the crest, just at the beginning of the downgrade. The coach must have just started to move downhill when the robbers jumped out from the bushes, suggested Dave. Sure enough, that's probably how come Tim to make a mistake. He figured he could give the horses the whip and make a getaway. The hold-up saw that. They had to shoot to kill or lose the gold. Being as he was a cold-blooded killer, he shot. There were two pinpoints of light in Emerson Crawford's eyes. He knew now the kind of man they were hunting. He was an assassin of a deadly type, not a wild cowboy who had fired in excitement because his nerves had betrayed him. Yes, Tim knew what he was doing. He took a chance the hold-ups wouldn't shoot to kill. Most of them won't. Well, that was his mistake. If he'd seen the face behind the mask, he would have known better, said Dave. Crawford quartered over the ground. Just like I thought, Dave. Applegate and his posse have been here and stomped out any tracks the robbers left. No way of telling which of all these footprints belonged to them. Likely none of them. If I didn't know better, I'd think someone had been given a dance here the way the ground is cut up. 
they made a wide circle to try to pick up the trail wanted and again a still larger one both of these attempts failed looks to me like they flew away the cattleman said at last horses have got hoofs and hoofs make tracks i see plenty of these but i don't find any place where the animals waited while this thing was being pulled off the sheriff's posse had milled over the whole ground so thoroughly we can't be sure but there's a point in what you say maybe they left their horses farther up the hill and walked back to them dave hazarded no son this job was planned careful now the hold-ups didn't know whether they'd have to make a quick getaway or not they would have their horses handy but out of sight why not in the dry ditch back of the cottonwoods asked dave with a flash of light crawford stared at him but at last shook his head i reckon not in the sand and clay there the hoofs would show too plain what if the hold-ups knew the ditch was going to be filled before the pursuit got started you mean i mean they might have arranged to have the water turned into the lateral to wipe out their tracks well, i'll be dogged if you ain't on a warm trail son murmured crawford and if they knew that why wouldn't they ride either up or down the ditch and leave no tracks at all they would for a way anyhow up or down which down so as to reach malapi and get into the gusher before word came of the hold-up guessed crawford up because in the hills there's less chance of being seen differed dave crooks like them can fix up an alibi when they need one they had to get away unseen in a hurry and to get rid of the gold soon in case they should be seen you rung the bell son up it is it's an instinct of an outlaw to make for the hills where he can hole up when in trouble the prospector had been out of the conversation long enough depends who did this he said if they came from the town they'd want to get back there in a hurry if not they'd steer clear folks once when i was in oklahoma a nigger went to a house and shot a white man he claimed owed him money he made his getaway look like and the whole town hunting for him for fifty miles they found him two days later in the cellar of the man he had killed well you can go look in tim harrigan's cellar if you've a mind to dave and i are going up the ditch said the old cattleman smiling i'll tag along seeing as i've been drug in this far all i'll say is that when we get to the bottom of this we'll find it was done by fellows you'd never suspect i know human nature my guess is no drunken cowboy pulled this off no sir i'd look higher for the men how about parson brown and the school superintendent asked crawford you can laugh all right wait and see somehow i don't make mistakes i'm lucky that way use my judgment i reckon anyhow i always guess right on presidential elections and prize fights you gotta know men in my line of business i study em hardly ever peg em wrong fellow said to me one day how's it come thomas you most always call the turn i give him an answer in one word psychology the trailers scanned closely the edge of the irrigation ditch here too they failed to get results there were tracks enough close to the lateral but apparently none of them led down to the bed of it the outlaws no doubt had carefully obliterated their tracks at this place in order to give no starting point for the pursuit i'll go up on the left hand side you take the right dave said crawford we've got to find where they left the ditch the prospector took the sandy bed of the dry canal as his path he chose it for two reasons there was less brush to obstruct his progress and he could reach the ears of both his auditors better as he burbled his comments on affairs in general and the wisdom of mr thomas in particular the ditch was climbing into the hills zigzagging up draws in order to find the most even grade the three men travelled slowly for sanders and crawford had to read signs on every foot of the way chances are they didn't leave the ditch till they heard the water coming the cattleman said these fellows knew their business and they were playing safe dave pulled up he went down on his knees and studied the ground then jumped down into the ditch and examined the bank here's where they got out he announced thomas pressed forward with one outstretched hand the young man held him back just a minute i want mr crawford to see this before it's touched the old cattleman examined the side of the canal the clay showed where a sharp hoof had reached for a footing missed and pawed down the bank 
higher up was the faint mark of a shoe on the loose rubble at the edge looks like he assented study of the ground above showed the trail of two horses striking off at right angle from the ditch toward the mouth of a box canyon about a mile distant the horses were both larger than broncos one of them was shod one of the shoes badly worn was broken and part of it gone on the left side the riders were taking no pains apparently to hide their course no doubt they relied on the full ditch to blot out pursuit the trail led through the canyon over a divide beyond and down into a small grassy valley at the summit crawford gave strict orders no talking mr thomas this is serious business now we're in enemy country and we've got to soft foot it the foothills were bristling with chaparral behind any scrub oak or cedar under cover of an aspen thicket or even of a clump of gray sage an enemy with murder in his heart might be lurking here an ambush was much more likely than in the sun-scorched plain they had left the three men left the footpath where it had dipped down into the park and followed the rim to the left passing through a heavy growth of manzanita to a bare hill dotted with scrubby sage at the other side of which was a small gulch of aspen straggling down into the valley back of these a log cabin squatted on the slope one had to be almost upon it before it could be seen its back door looked down upon the entrance to a canyon this was fenced across to make a corral the cattleman and the cowpuncher looked at each other without verbal comment a message better not put into words flashed from one to the other this looked like the haunt of rustlers here they could pursue their nefarious calling unmolested not once a year would anybody except one of themselves enter this valley and if a stranger did so he would know better than to push his way into the canyon horses were drowsing sleepily in the corral dave slid from the saddle and spoke to crawford in a low voice i'm going down to have a look at those horses he said unfastening his rope from the tientos the cattleman nodded he drew from its case beneath his leg a rifle and held it across the pommel it was not necessary for sanders to ask nor for him to promise protection while the younger man was making his trip of inspection both were men who knew the frontier code and each other at a time of action speech beyond the curtest of monosyllables was surplusage dave walked and slid down the rubble of the steep hillside clambered down a rough face of rock and dropped into the corral he wore a revolver but did not draw it he did not want to give anybody in the house an excuse to shoot him without warning his glance swept over the horses searched the hoofs of each it found one shod a rangy roan gelding the cowpuncher's rope whined through the air and settled down upon the shoulders of the animal the gelding went sun-fishing as a formal protest against the lariat, then surrendered tamely. Dave patted it gently, stroked the neck, and spoke softly reassuring words. He picked up one of the front feet and examined the shoe. This was badly worn, and on the left side part of it had broken off. A man came to the back door of the cabin and stretched in a long and luxuriant yawn carelessly and casually his eyes wandered over the aspens and into the corral for a moment he stood frozen his arms still flung wide from the aspens came down crawford's voice cool and ironic much obliged shorty leave em right up and save trouble the squat cowpuncher's eyes moved back to the aspens and found there the owner of the d-bar lazy r what do you want he growled sullenly you just now step right out from the house shorty that's right anybody else in the house no you'll be luckier if you tell the truth i'm telling it hope so dave step forward and get his six-shooter keep him between you and the house if anything happens to you i'm going to kill him right now shorty shivered hardy villain though he was there had been nobody in the house when he had left it but he had been expecting someone shortly if his partner arrived and began shooting, he knew that Crawford would drop him in his tracks. His throat went dry as a lime kiln. He wanted to shout out to the man who might be inside not to shoot at any cost. But he was a game and loyal ruffian. He would not spoil his confederate's chance by betraying him. 
If he said nothing, the man might come, realize the situation, and slip away unobserved. Sanders took the man's gun and ran his hand over his thick body to make sure he had no concealed weapon. I'm going to back away. You come after me, step by step, so close I could touch you with the gun, ordered Dave. The man followed him as directed, his hand still in the air. His captor kept him in a line between him and the house door. Crawford rode down to join them. The man who claimed not to be foolhardy stayed up in the timber. This was no business of his. He did not want to be the target of any shots from the cabin. The cattleman swung down from the saddle. Sure, we'll light and come in, Shorty. No, you first. I'm right at your heels with this gun poking into your ribs. Don't make any mistake. You'd never have time to explain it. The cabin had only one room. The bunks were over at one side, the stove and the table at the other. Two six-pane windows flanked the front door. The room was empty except for the three men now entering. "'You live here, Shorty?' asked Crawford curtly. "'Yes,' the answer was sulky and reluctant. "'Alone?' "'Yes.' "'Why?' snapped the cattleman. Shorty's defiant eyes met his. "'My business.' "'Mine, too. I'll bet a dollar if you're nesting in these hills you can't have but one business.' "'Prove it! Prove it!' retorted Shorty angrily. "'Some day. Not now.' Crawford turned to Sanders. "'What about the horse you looked at, Dave?' "'Same one we've been trailing, the one with the broken shoe.' "'That your horse, Shorty?' "'Maybe so, maybe not.' "'You've been having company here lately,' Crawford went on. "'Who's your guest?' "'You seem to be right now. "'You and your friend the convict,' sneered the short cowpuncher. "'Don't use that word again, Shorty,' advised the ranchman in a voice gently ominous. "'Why not? True, ain't it? Doesn't deny it none, does he?' "'We'll not discuss that. Where were you yesterday?' "'Here, part of the day. Where was you?' demanded Shorty impudently. "'Seems to me I heard you was right busy.' "'What part of the day? Begin at the beginning and tell us what you did. "'You may put your hands down.' "'Why, I got up in the morning and put on my pants and my boots,' jeered Shorty. "'I don't recollect whether I put on my hat or not. "'Maybe I did. I cooked breakfast and ate it. "'I chawed tobacco. I cooked dinner and ate it. "'Smoked and chawed some more. Cooked supper and ate it. "'Went to bed. That's all.' "'Why, no. I fed the critters and fixed up a busted stirrup.' "'Who was with you?' "'I was plumb lonesome yesterday. This any business of yours, by the way, Em? "'Think again, Shorty. Who was with you?' The heavy-set cowpuncher helped himself to a chew of tobacco. "'I told you once I was alone. Ain't seen anybody but you for a week.' "'Then how did you hear yesterday was my busy day?' Crawford thrust at him. For a moment, Shorty was taken aback. Before he could answer, Dave spoke. Man coming up from the creek. Crawford took crisp command. Back in that corner, Shorty. Dave, you stand back too. Cover him soon as he shows up. Dave nodded. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miller Talks. A man stood in the doorway, big, fat, swaggering. In his younger days, his deep chest and broad shoulders had accompanied great strength, but fat had accumulated in layers. He was a mountain of sagging flesh. His breath came in wheezy puffs. "'Next time you get your own—' The voice faltered, died away. The perturbant eyes, still cold and fishy, passed fearfully from one to another of those in the room. It was plain that the bottom had dropped out of his heart. One moment he had straddled the world a colossus. The next he was collapsing like a punctured balloon. "'God Almighty!' he gasped. Don't shoot. I, I give up. He was carrying a bucket of water. It dropped from his nerveless fingers and spilt over the floor. 
Like a bullet out of a gun, Crawford shot a question at him. Where have you hidden the money you got from the stage? The loose mouth of the convict opened. Why, we, ah, we. Keep your trap shut, you darn fool, ordered Shorty. Crawford jabbed his rifle into the ribs of the rustler. Yours too, Shorty. But the damage had been done. Miller's flabby will had been braced by a stronger one. He had been given time to recover from his dismay. He moistened his lips with his tongue and framed his lie. "'I was going to say you must be mistaken, Mr. Crawford,' he whined. Shorty laughed heartily, spat tobacco juice at a knot in the floor, and spoke again. "'Third-degree stuff, eh? It won't buy you a thing, Crawford. Miller wasn't in that hold-up any more than I—' "'Let Miller do his own talking, Shorty. He don't need any lead from you.' Shorty looked hard at the cattleman with unflinching eyes. "'Don't get on the peck, Em. You got no business covering me with that gun. I know you got reasons aplenty for trying to bluff us into saying we held up the stage, but we don't bluff worth a cent, see?' Crawford saw. He had failed to surprise a confession out of Miller by the narrowest of margins. If he had had time to get Shorty out of the room before the convict's appearance, the fellow would have come through. As it was, he had missed his opportunity. A head, followed by a round-barrel body, came in cautiously from the lean-to at the rear. "'Everything all right, Mr. Crawford? Thought I'd drop on down to see if you didn't need any help.' "'None, thanks, Mr. Thomas,' the cattleman answered dryly. "'Well, you never can tell.' The prospector nodded genially to Shorty, then spoke again to the man with the rifle. "'Found any clue to the hold-up yet?' "'We found the men who did it.' replied Crawford. "'Knew em all the time, I reckon,' <laughs> scoffed Shorty with a harsh laugh. Dave drew his chief aside, still keeping a vigilant eye on the prisoners. "'We've got to play our hand different. Shorty's game, he can't be bluffed. But Miller can. I found out years ago he squeals at physical pain. We'll start for home. After a while we'll give Shorty a chance to make a getaway. Then we'll turn the screws on Miller.' All right, Dave, you run it. I'll back your play, his friend said. They disarmed Miller, made him saddle two of the horses in the corral, and took the back trail across the valley to the divide. It was here they gave Shorty his chance of escape. Miller was leading the way up the trail with Crawford, Thomas, Shorty, and Dave in the order named. Dave rode forward to confer with the owner of the D Bar Lazy R. For three seconds his back was turned to the squat cowpuncher. Shorty whirled his horse and flung it wildly down the precipitous slope. Sanders galloped after him, firing his revolver three times, and after a short chase gave up the pursuit. He rode back to the party on the summit. Crawford glanced around at the heavy chaparral. "'How about off here a bit, Dave?' The younger man agreed. He turned to Miller. "'We're going to hang you.' he said quietly. The pasty color of the fat man ebbed till his face seemed entirely bloodless. "'My God! You wouldn't do that!' he moaned. He clung feebly to the horn of his saddle as Sanders led the horse into the brush. He whimpered, snuffling an appeal for mercy repeated over and over. The party had not left the road a hundred yards behind when a man jogged past on his way into the valley. He did not see them, nor did they see him. Underneath a rather scrubby cedar, Dave drew up. He glanced it over critically. "'Think it'll do?' he asked Crawford in a voice the prisoner could just hear. "'Yep. That big limb'll hold him. the old cattleman answered in the same low voice. "'Better let him stay right on the horse, then we'll lead it out from under him. Miller pleaded for his life objectedly. His blood had turned to water. "'Honest, I didn't shoot Harrigan. Why, I'm that tender-hearted I wouldn't hurt a kitten. I, I, oh, don't do that, for God's sake!' Thomas was almost as white as the outlaw. "'You don't aim to—you wouldn't—' Crawford's face was as cold and as hard as steel. "'Why not? He's a murderer. He tried to gun Dave here when the boy didn't have a six-shooter.' We'll just get rid of him now. 
he threw a rope over the convict's head and adjusted it to the folds of his fat throat. The man under condemnation could hardly speak. His throat was dry as the desert dust below. Ah, I done Mr. Sanders a meanness. I'm sorry. I was drunk. You lied about him and sent him to the penitentiary. I'll fix that. Let me go and I'll make that right. How will you make it right? asked Crawford grimly, and the weight of his arm drew the rope so tight that Miller winced. Can you give him back the years he's lost? No, sir, no, the man whispered eagerly. But I can tell how it was. That we fired first at him. Doble did that, and then, accidental, I killed Doble whilst I was shooting at Mr. Sanders. Dave strode forward, his eyes like great live coals. What? Say that again, he cried. Yes, sir, I did it accidental when doble run forward in front of me that's right i'm plumb sorry i didn't tell the court so when you was on trial mr sanders i reckon i was scared too will you tell this of your own free will to the sheriff down in malapi asked crawford i sure will yes sir mr crawford the man's terror had swept away all thought of anything but the present peril his color was a seasick green his great body trembled like a jelly shaken from a mold. "'It's too late now,' cut in Dave savagely. "'We came up about this stage robbery. Unless he'll clear that up, I vote to finish the job.' "'Maybe we'd better,' agreed the cattleman. "'I'll tie the rope to the trunk of the tree, and you lead the horse from under him, Dave.' Miller broke down. He groveled. "'I'll tell. I'll tell all I know.' Doug Doble and Shorty held up the stage. I don't know who killed the driver. They didn't say when they come back. You let the water into the ditch, suggested Crawford. Yes, sir. I did that. They were sheltering me, and of course I had to do like they said. When did you escape? On the way back to the penitentiary. A fellow gave the deputy sheriff a drink on the train. It was doped. We had that fixed. The keys on the handcuffs was in the deputy's pocket. When he went to sleep, we unlocked the cuffs, and I got off at the next depot. Horses was waiting there for us. Who do you mean by us? Who was with you? I don't know who he was. Fellow said Brad Steelman sent him to fix things up for me. Thomas borrowed the field glasses of Crawford. Presently, he lowered them. Two fellows come in hell for leather across the valley, he said in a voice that expressed his fears. The cattleman took the glasses and looked. Shorty's found a friend. Doug Doble, likely. They're carrying rifles. We'll have trouble. They'll see we stopped at the head of the pass, he said quietly. Much shaken already, the oil prospector collapsed at the prospect before him. He was a man of peace and always had been, in spite of the valiant promise of his tongue. None of my funeral, he said, his lips white. I'm hitting the trail from Lappy right now. He wheeled his horse and jumped it to a gallop. The roan plunged through the chaparral and soon was out of sight. "'We'll fix Mr. Miller so he won't make us any trouble during the ruckus,' Crawford told Dave. He threw the coiled rope over the heaviest branch of the cedar, drew it tight, and fastened it to the trunk of the tree. "'Now you'll stay hitched,' he went on, speaking to their prisoner. "'And you better hold that horse mighty steady, because if he jumps from under you— It'll be good-bye for one scalawag. If you would let me down, I'd do like you told me, Mr. Crawford, pleaded Miller. It's right uncomfortable here. Keep still. Don't say a word. Your friends are getting close. Let a chirp out of you and you'll never have time to be sorry, warned the cattleman. The two men tied their horses behind some heavy mesquite and chose their own cover. Here they crouched down and waited. They could hear the horses of the outlaws climbing the hill out of the valley to the pass. Then, down in the canyon, they caught a glimpse of Thomas in wild flight. The bandits stopped at the divide. "'They'll be heading this way in a minute,' Crawford whispered. His companion nodded agreement. They were wrong. There came the sound of a whoop, a sudden clatter of hoofs, the diminishing beat of horses' feet. "'They've seen Thomas, and they're after him on the jump.' suggested dave his friend's eyes crinkled to a smile sure enough 
They figure he's tail end of our party. Well, I'll bet Thomas gives them a good run for their money. He's right careless sometimes, but he's no foolhardy idiot, and he don't aim to argue with birds like these, even though he's a rip-snorter when he gets going good and won't stand any devilin'. He'll talk em to death if they catch him, Dave answered. Back to business. What's our next move, son? Some more conversation with Mr. Miller. Probably he can tell us where the gold is hidden. Whoopee, I'll bet he can. You do the talking. I've a notion he's more scared of you. The fat convict tried to make a stand against them. He pleaded ignorance. I don't know where they hid the stuff. They didn't tell me. Sounds reasonable. And you in with them on the deal, said Sanders. Well, you're in hard luck. We don't give two hoots for you anyhow, but we decided to take you into town with us if you come through clean. If not... He shrugged his shoulders and glanced up at the branch above. Miller swallowed a lump in his throat. You wouldn't treat me that away, Mr. Sanders. I'm getting to be an old man now. I done wrong, but I'm sure right sorry, he whimpered. The eyes of the man who had spent years in prison at Canyon City were hard as jade. The fat man read a day of judgment in his stern and somber face. "'I'll tell,' the crook broke down, clammy beads of perspiration all over his pallid face. "'I'll tell you right where it's at. In the lean-to of the shack, southwest corner, buried in a gunny sack.' They rode back across the valley to the cabin. Miller pointed out the spot where the stolen treasure was cached. With an old axe as a spade, Dave dug away the dirt till he came to a bit of sacking. Crawford scooped out the loose earth with his gauntlet and dragged out a gunny sack. Inside it were a number of canvas bags showing the broken wax seals of the express company. These contained gold pieces, apparently fresh from the mint. A hurried sum in arithmetic showed that approximately all the gold taken from the stage must be here. Dave packed it on the back of his saddle while Crawford penciled a note to leave in the cache in place of the money. The note said, This is no safe place to leave seventeen thousand dollars, Doug. I'm taking it to town to put in the bank. If you want to make inquiries about it, come in and we'll talk it over. You and me and Applegate. Emerson Crawford Five minutes later, the three men were once more riding rapidly across the valley toward the summit of the divide. The loop of Crawford's lariat still encircled the gross neck of the convict. End of chapter 25「Twenty Six of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dave accepts an invitation. Crawford and Dave, with their prisoner, lay out in the chaparral for an hour, then made their way back to Malapi by a wide circuit. They did not want to meet Shorty and Doble, for that would result in a pitched battle. They preferred rather to make a report to the sheriff and let him attempt the arrests of the bandits. Reluctantly, under the pressure of much prodding, Miller repeated his story to Sheriff Applegate. Under the circumstances, he was not sorry that he was to be returned to the penitentiary, for he recognized that his life at large would not be safe so long as Shorty and Doble were ranging the hills. Both of them were bad men, in the usual Western acceptance of the term, and an accomplice who betrayed them would meet short shrift at their hands. The sheriff gave Crawford a receipt for the gold after they had counted it and found none missing. The old cattleman rose from the table and reached for his hat. "'Come on, son,' he said to Dave. "'I'll say we've done a good day's work. Both of us were under a cloud. Now we're clear. We're going up to the house to have some supper. Applegate, you get both of the confessions of Miller fixed up, won't you?' I'll want the one about George Doble's death to take with me to the governor of Colorado. I'm taking the train tomorrow. I'll have the district attorney fix up the papers, the sheriff promised. Emerson Crawford hooked an arm under the elbow of Sanders and left the office. I'm wondering about one thing, boy, he said. Did Miller kill George Doble accidentally or on purpose? I'm wondering about that myself. 
You remember that Denver bartender said they had been quarreling a good deal. They were having a row at the very time when I met them at the gate of the corral. It's a ten-to-one shot that Miller took the chance to plug Doble and make me pay for it. Looks likely, but we'll never know. Son, you've had a rotten deal handed you. The younger man's eyes were hard as steel. He clamped his jaw tight but made no comment. Nobody can give you back the years of your life you've lost, the cattleman went on but we'll get your record straightened out anyhow, so that won't stand against you. I know one little girl be tickled to hear the news. Joy always has stuck out that you were treated shameful. I reckon I'll not go up to your house tonight, Dave said in carefully modulated voice. I'm dirty and unshaven. Anyhow, I'd rather not go tonight. Crawford refused to accept this excuse. No, sir. You're coming with me, by gum. I got soap and water and razor up at the house, if that's what's troubling you. We've had a big day, and I'm going to celebrate by talking it all over again. Dad, gum, my hide, think of it, you solemn-faced old owl. This time last night I was most a pauper, and you sure were. Both of us were under the charge of having killed a man each. Tonight we're rich as that fella Crocus. Anyhow, I am, and you're hated that way and both of us have cleared our names to boot. Ain't you got any red blood in that big body of yours? I'll drop into the Delmonico and get a bite, then ride out to the jackpot. You will not, protested the cattleman. Look here, Dave. It's a showdown. Have you got anything against me? Dave met him eye to eye. Not a thing, Mr. Crawford. No man ever had a better friend. Anything against Joyce? No, sir. Don't hate my boy Keith, do you? How could I? Then what in hell ails you? You're not parlor shy, are you? Say the word and we'll eat in the kitchen, grinned Crawford. I'm not a society man, Sanders said lamely. He could not explain that the shadow of the prison walls were a barrier he could not cross, and they rose to bar him from all the joy and happiness of young life. Who in Mexico's talking about society? I said come up and eat supper with me and Joy and Keith. If you don't come, I'm going to be good and sore. I'll not stand for it, you darn old killjoy. I'll go, answered the invited man. He went, not because he wanted to go, but because he could not escape without being an ungracious bore. Joyce flew to meet her father, eyes eager, hands swift to caress his rough face and wrinkled coat. She bubbled with joy at his return, and when he told her that his news was of the best, the long lashes of the brown eyes misted with tears. The young man in the background was struck anew by the matronly tenderness of her relation to her father. She hovered about him as a mother does about her son returned from the wars. "'I brought company for supper, honey,' Emerson told her. She gave Dave her hand, flushed and smiling. I've been so worried, she explained. It's fine to know the news is good. I want to hear it all. We got the stolen money back, Joy, exploded her father. We know who took it, Doug Doble and that cowboy Shorty and Miller. But I thought Miller, he escaped. We caught him and brought him back to town with us. Crawford seized the girl by the shoulders. He was as keen as a boy to share his pleasure. And Joy, better news yet. Miller confessed he killed George Doble. Dave didn't do it at all. Joyce came to the young man impulsively, hand outstretched. She was glowing with delight, eyes kind and warm and glad. That's the best yet. Oh, Mr. Sanders, isn't it good? His impassive face gave no betrayal of any happiness he might feel in his vindication. Indeed, something almost sardonic in its expression chilled her enthusiasm. More than the passing of years separated them from the days when he had shyly but gaily wiped dishes for her in the kitchen, when he had worshipped her with a boy's uncritical adoration. Sanders knew it better than she, and cursed the habit of repression that had become a part of him in his prison days. He wanted to give her happy smile for smile, but he could not do it. All that was young and ardent and eager in him was dead. He could not let himself go. 
even when emotions flooded his heart no evidence of it reached his chill eyes and set face after he had come back from shaving he watched her flit about the room while she set the table she was the competent young mistress of the house with grave young authority she moved slenderly graceful he knew her mind was with the cook in the kitchen but she found time to order keith crisply to wash his face and hands time to gather flowers for the center of the table from the front yard and to keep up a running fire of talk with him and her father more of the woman than in the days when he had known her perhaps less of the carefree maiden she was essentially unchanged was what he might confidently have expected her to be emerson crawford was the same bluff hardy westerner a friend to tie to in sunshine and in storm even little keith just escaping from his baby ways had the same tricks and mannerisms nothing was different except himself he had become arid and hard and bitter he told himself regretfully keith was his slave a faithful admirer whose eyes fed upon his hero steadily he had heard the story of this young man's deeds discussed until dave had come to take on almost mythical proportions he asked a question in an awed voice how did you get this miller to confess the guest exchanged a glance with the host we had a talk with him did you oh no we just asked him if he didn't want to tell us all about it and seems he did maybe you touched his better feelings suggested keith with memories of an hour in sunday school when his teacher had made a vain appeal to his his father laughed maybe we did i noticed he was near blubberin i expect it's adios senor miller he's got two years more to serve and after that he'll have another nice long term to serve for robin's stage all i wish is we done the job more thorough and sent some friends of his along with him well that's up to applegate i'm glad it is said joyce emphatically any news today from jackpot number three asked the president of that company bob hart set in to get some supplies and had a note left for me at the post office miss joyce mentioned a trifle annoyed at herself because a blush insisted on flowing into her cheeks he says it's the biggest thing he ever saw but it's going to be awfully hard to control where is that note i must have put it somewhere emerson's eyes flickered mischief oh well never mind about the note that's private property i reckon i'm sure if i can find it i'll bet my boots you can't though he teased dad what will mr sanders think you know that's nonsense bob wrote because i asked him to let me know sure why wouldn't the secretary and field superintendent of the jackpot company keep the daughter of the president informed i'll have it read into the minutes of our next board meeting that it's in his duties to keep you posted oh well if you want to talk foolishness she pouted there's something else i'm going to have to put into the minutes of the next meeting dave crawford went on and that's your election as treasurer of the company i want officers around me that i can trust son i don't know anything about finance or about bookkeeping dave said you'll learn we'll have a bookkeeper of course i want someone for treasure that's level-headed and knows how to make a quick turn when he has to someone that uses the gray stuff in his coconut we'll fix a salary when we get going you and bob are going to have the active management of this concern cattle's my line i aim to stick to it him and you can talk it over and fix your duties so's they won't conflict burns of course will run the actual drilling he's an a one man don't let him go dave was profoundly touched no man could be kinder to his own son could show more confidence in him than emerson crawford was to one who had no claims upon him he murmured a dry thank you then feeling this to be inadequate added i'll try to see you don't regret this the cattleman was a shrewd judge of men his action now was not based solely upon humanitarian motives here was a keen man quick-witted steady and wholly to be trusted one certain to push himself to the front it was good business to make it worth his while to stick to crawford's enterprises he said as much to dave bluntly 
and you ain't in for any easy time either he added we've got oil we're flooded with it so i hear several thousand dollars worth a day is running off and seeping into the desert bob hart and jed burns have got the job of putting the lid on the pot but when they do that you've got a bigger job looks bigger to me anyhow you've got to get rid of that oil find a market for it sell it chip it away to make room for more get busy son crawford waved his hand after the manner of one who has shifted responsibility and does not expect to worry about it moreover and likewise we're shy of money to keep operating until we can sell the stuff you have to raise scads of mazuma son in this oil game dollars sure have got wings no matter how tight your pockets are buttoned they fly right out i doubt whether you'll have chosen the right man the ex-cowpuncher said smiling faintly the most i ever borrowed in my life was twenty-five dollars you borrow twenty-five thousand the same way only it's easier if the luck's breaking right the cattleman assured him cheerfully the easiest thing in the world to get a hold of is money when you've already got lots of it the trouble is we haven't well you have to learn to look like you knew where it grew on bushes emerson told him grinning i can see you've chosen me for a nice lazy job anything but that son you don't want to make any mistake about this thing brad steelman's going to fight like a son of a gun he'll strike at our credit and at our market and at our means of transportation he'll fight twenty-four hours of the day and he's the slickest crookedest gray wolf that ever skulked over the range the foreman of the d bar lazy r came in after supper for a conference with his boss he and crawford got their heads together in the sitting-room and the young people gravitated out to the porch joyce pressed dave into service to help her water the roses and keith hung around in order to be near dave occasionally he asked questions irrelevant to the conversation these were embarrassing or not as it happened joyce delivered a little lecture on the culture of roses not because she considered herself an authority but because her guest's conversation was mostly of the monosyllabic order he was not awkward or self-conscious rather a man given to silence say mr sanders how does it feel to be wounded keith blurted out you mustn't ask personal questions keith his sister told him oh well i already asked this one the boy suggested ingenuously don't know keith answered the young man i never was really wounded if you mean this scratch in the shoulder i hardly felt it at all till afterward golly i bet i wouldn't tackle a feller shootin at me the way that miller was at you the youngster commented in naive admiration bedtime for little boys keith his sister reminded him oh let me stay up a while longer he begged joyce was firm she had schooled her impulses to resist the little fellow's blandishments but dave noticed that she was affectionate even in her refusal i'll come up and say good-night after a while keithie she promised as she kissed him to the gaunt-faced man watching them she was the symbol of all most to be desired in woman she embodied youth health charm she was life's springtime its promise of fulfillment yet already an immaculate madonna in the beauty of her generous soul he was young enough in his knowledge of her sex to be unaware that nature often gives soft trout pool eyes of tenderness to coquettes and wonderful hair with the lights and shadows of an autumn painted valley to giggling fools joyce was neither coquette nor fool she was a sensual woman in the making with all the faults and fine brave impulses of her years unconsciously perhaps she was showing her best side to her guest as maidens have done to men since eve first smiled on adam dave had closed his heart to love it was to have no room in his life to his morbid sensibilities the shadow of the prison walls still stretched between him and joyce it did not matter that he was innocent that all his small world would soon know of his vindication the facts stood for years he had been shut away from men a leprous thing labeled unclean he had dwelt in a place of furtive whisperings of sinister sounds his nostrils had inhaled the odor of musty clothes and steamed food 
his fingers had touched moisture sweating through the walls and in his small dark cell he had hunted graybacks the hopeless squalor of it at times had driven him almost mad as he saw it now his guilt was of minor importance if he had not fired the shot that killed george doble that was merely a chance detail what counted against him was that his soul was marked with the taint of the criminal through association and habit of thought he could reason with this feeling and temporarily destroy it he could drag it into the light and laugh it away but subconsciously it persisted as a horror from which he could not escape a man cannot touch pitch even against his own will and not be defiled you're keith's hero you know the girl told dave her face bubbling to unexpected mirth he tries to walk and talk like you he asks the queerest questions Today I caught him diving at a pillow on the bed. He was making believe to be you when you were shot. Her nearness in the soft shadowy night shook his self-control. The music of her voice with its drawling intonations played on his heartstrings. Think I'll go now, he said abruptly. You must come again, she told him. Keith wants you to teach him how to rope. You won't mind, will you? The long lashes lifted innocently from the soft, deep eyes, which rested in his for a moment and set clamoring a disturbance in his blood. "'I'll be right busy,' he said awkwardly, bluntly. She drew back within herself. "'I've forgotten how busy you are, Mr. Sanders. Of course we mustn't impose on you,' she said, cold and stiff as only offended youth can be. Striding into the night, Dave cursed the fate that had made him what he was. He had hurt her boorishly by his curt refusal of her friendship, yet the heart inside him was a wild river of love. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Gunsight Pass – How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West – by William MacLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain at the jackpot the day lasted twenty-four hours in malapi f sanders walked along hunipero street on his way to the downtown corral from crawford's house saloons and gambling houses advertised their attractions candidly and noisily they seemed bursting with raw and vehement life the strains of fiddles and the sound of shuffling feet were pierced occasionally by the whoop of a drunken reveller once there rang out the high notes of a woman's hysterical laughter cowponies and packed burros drooped listlessly at the hitching rack even loaded wagons were waiting to take the road as soon as the drivers could tear themselves away from the attractions of kino and a last drink Junipero street was not the usual crooked lane that serves as the main thoroughfare for business in a mining town for malapi had been a cow town before the discovery of oil it lay on the wide prairie and not in a gulch. The street was broad and dusty, flanked by false front stores, flat-roofed adobes, and corrugated iron buildings imported hastily since the first boom. At the Staghorn Corral, Dave hired a horse and saddled for a night ride. On his way to the jackpot, he passed a dozen outfits headed for the new strike they were hauling supplies of food tools timber and machinery to the oil camp out of the night a mule skinner shouted a profane and drunken greeting to him a mexican with a burro train gave him a low-voiced buenas noches senor a fine mist of oil began to spray him when he was still a mile away from the well it grew denser as he came near he found Bob Hart in oilskins and rubber boots, bossing a gang of scrapers, giving directions to a second one building a dam across a draw, and supervising a third group engaged in siphoning crude oil from one sump to another. From head to foot, Hart and his assistants were wet to the skin with the black crude oil. "'Lo, Dave! One sure enough little spouter!' Bob shouted cheerfully. "'Number three's sure a-hittin' her up. She's no coffer stays right steady on the job but i've wallowed in a million barrels of the stuff since morning he waded through a visit pool to dave and asked a question in a low voice what's the good word we had a little luck admitted sanders 
then plumbed out his budget of news. Got the express money back, captured one of the robbers, forced a confession out of him, and left him with the sheriff. Bob did an Indian war dance in hip boots. You're the darndest go-getter I ever did see. Tell it to me, you ornery old scalawag. His friend told the story of the day so far as it related to the robbery. I could have told you Miller would weaken when you had the rope round his soft neck. Shorty would have gone through and told you all where to get off at. Yes, Miller is yellow. He didn't quit with the robbery, Bob. Must have been scared bad, I reckon. He admitted that he killed George Doble. By accident, he claimed. Says Doble ran in front of him while he was shooting at me. Have you got that down on paper? demanded Hart. Yes. Bob caught his friend's hand. I reckon the long lane has turned for you, old socks. I can't tell you how damn glad I am. Doble needed killing, but I'd rather you hadn't done it. The other man made no comment on this phase of the situation. This brings Doug Doble out into the open at last. He'll come pretty near going to the pen for this. I can't see Applegate arresting him. He'll fight, Doug will. My notion is he'll take to the hills and throw off all pretense. If he does, he'll be the worst killer ever was known in this part of the country. You and Crawford want to look out for him, Dave. Crawford says he wants me to be treasurer of the company, Bob. You and I are the manager, he says, with Burns doing the drilling. That's great. He told me he was going to ask you. Bet you we make the old jackpot hum. Do you ever hear of a man land poor, Bob? Sure have. Well, right now, we're oil poor. According to what the old man says, there's no cash in the treasury, and we've got bills that have to be paid. You know that ten thousand he paid into the bank to satisfy the note? He borrowed it from a friend who took it out of a trust fund to loan it to him. He didn't tell me who the man is, but he said his friend would get into trouble a plenty if it's found out before he replaces the money. Then we've got to keep our labor bills paid right up. Some of the other accounts can't wait. Could we borrow money on this gusher? We'll have to do that. Trouble is that oil isn't a marketable asset until it reaches the refinery. We could sell stock, of course, but we don't want to do much of that unless we're forced to it. Our play is to keep control and not let any other interest in to oust us. It's going to take some scratching. Looks like, agreed Bob. Any use trying the bank here? I'll try it, but we'll not accept any call loan. They say Steelman owns the bank. He won't let us have money unless there's some nigger in the woodpile. I'll probably have to try Denver. That'll take time. Yes. And time's one thing we haven't got too much of. Whoever underwrites this for us will send an expert back with me and we'll wait for his report before making a loan. We'll have to talk it over with Crawford and find out how much treasury stock we'll have to sell locally to keep the business going till I make a raise. You and the old man decide that, Dave. I can't get away from here till we get number three roped and muzzled. I'll vote for whatever you two say. An hour later, Dave rode back to town. End of chapter 27、Chapter、28 of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dave Meets a Financier. On more careful consideration, Crawford and Sanders decided against trying to float the jackpot with local money, except by the sale of enough stock to keep going until the company's affairs could be put on a substantial basis. To apply to the Malapi Bank for a loan would be to expose their financial condition to Steelman, and it was certain that he would permit no accommodation except upon terms that would make it possible to wreck the company. I'm taking the train for Denver tomorrow, Dave. The older man said, You stay here for two, three days and sell enough stock to keep us off the rocks. Then you hot foot it for Denver, too. By the time you get there, I'll have it all fixed up with the governor about a pardon. Dave found no difficulty in disposing of a limited amount of stock in Malapi at a good price. This done, he took the stage for the junction and followed Crawford to Denver. 
an unobtrusive little man with large white teeth showing stood in line behind him at the ticket window his destination also it appeared was the colorado capital if dave had been a believer in fairy tales he might have thought himself the hero of one a few days earlier he had come to Malapi on this same train, in a day coach, poorly dressed, with no job and no prospects in life. He had been poor, discredited, a convict on parole. Now he wore good clothes, traveled in a pullman, ate in the diner, was a man of consequence, and, at least on paper, was on the road to wealth. He would put up at the Albany instead of a cheap rooming house, and he would meet on legitimate business some of the big financial men of the west the thing was hardly thinkable yet a turn of the wheel of fortune had done it for him in an hour the position in which sanders found himself was possible only because crawford himself was a financial babe in the woods he had borrowed large sums of money often but always from men who trusted him and held his word as better security than collateral the cattleman was of the outdoors type to whom the letter of the law means little a debt was a debt and a piece of paper with his name on it did not make payment any more obligatory if he had known more about capital and its methods of finding an outlet he would never have sent so unsophisticated a man as dave sanders on such a mission for dave too was a child in the business world he knew nothing of the inside deals by which industrial enterprises are underwritten and corporations managed. It was, he supposed, sufficient for his purpose that the company for which he wanted backing was sure to pay large dividends when properly put on its feet. But Dave had assets of value even for such a task. He had a single-track mind. He was determined even to obstinacy. He thought straight and so directly that he could walk through subtleties without knowing they existed. When he reached Denver, he discovered that Crawford had followed the governor to the western part of the state, where that official had gone to open a sectional fair. Sanders had no credentials except a letter of introduction to the manager of the stockyards. "'What can I do for you?' asked that gentleman. He was quite willing to exert himself moderately as a favor to Emerson Crawford, vice president of the American Live Stock Association. I want to meet Horace Graham. I can give you a note of introduction to him. You'll probably have to get an appointment with him through his secretary. He's a tremendously busy man. Dave's talk with the great man's secretary over the telephone was not satisfactory. Mr. Graham, he learned, had every moment full for the next two days, after which he would leave for a business trip to the east. There were other wealthy men in Denver who might be induced to finance the jackpot, but Dave intended to see Graham first. The big railroad builder was a fighter. He was hammering through, in spite of heavy opposition from transcontinental lines, a short cut across the Rocky Mountains from Denver. He was a pioneer, one who would take a chance on a good thing in the plunging, western way. In his rugged, clean-cut character was much that appealed to the managers of the jackpot. Sanders called at the financier's office and sent in his card by the youthful Cerberus who kept watch at the gate. The card got no farther than the great man's private secretary. After a wait of more than an hour, Dave made overtures to the boy. A dollar passed from him to the youth and established a friendly relation. "'What's the best way to reach Mr. Graham, son? I've got important business that won't wait.' "'Dunno. He's awful busy. You ain't got no appointment. Can you get a note to him? I've got a five-dollar bill for you if you can.' "'I'll take a whirl at it, just before he goes to lunch.' Dave penciled a line on a card. If you are not too busy to make one hundred thousand dollars today, you had better see me. He signed his name. Ten minutes later, the office boy caught Graham as he rose to leave for lunch. The big man read the note. What kind of looking fellow is he? he asked the boy. Kind of solemn looking guy, sir. The boy remembered the dollar received on account and the five dollars on the horizon. Big, straight standing, honest fellow, from Arizona or Texas, maybe. Look good to me. The financier frowned down at the note in doubt, twisting it in his fingers. 
A dozen times a week his privacy was assailed by some crazy inventor or crook promoter. He remembered that he had had a letter from someone about this man. Something of strength in the chirography of the note in his hand, and something of simple directness in the wording decided him to give an interview. "'Show him in,' he said abruptly, and while he waited in the office rated himself for his folly in wasting time. Underneath bushy brows, steel-gray eyes took Dave in shrewdly. "'Well, what is it?' snapped the millionaire. "'The new gusher in the Malapi pool,' answered Sanders at once, and his gaze was as steady as that of the big state builder. "'You represent the parties that own it?' "'Yes. And you want?' financial backing to put it on its feet until we can market the product. Why don't you work through your local bank? Another oil man, an enemy of our company, controls the Malapi Bank. Graham fired question after question at him, crisply, abruptly, and Sanders gave him back straight, short answers. Sit down, ordered the railroad builder, resuming his own seat. Tell me the whole story of the company. Dave told it and in the telling he found it necessary to sketch the crawford Steelman feud. He brought himself into the narrative as little as possible, but the grizzled millionaire drew enough from him to set Graham's eyes to sparkling. "'Come back tomorrow at noon,' decided the great man. "'I'll let you know my decision then.' The young man knew he was dismissed, but left the office elated. Graham had been favorably impressed. He liked the proposition, believed in its legitimacy and its possibilities— Dave felt sure he would send an expert to Malapi with him to report on it as an investment. If so, he would almost certainly agree to put money on it. The man with prominent white front teeth had followed Dave to the office of Horace Graham, had seen him enter, and later had seen him come out with a look on his face that told of victory. The man tried to get admittance to the financier and failed. He went back to his hotel and wrote a short letter which he signed with a fictitious name. This he sent by special delivery to Graham. The letter was brief and to the point. It said, Don't do business with David Sanders without investigating his record. He is a horse thief and a convicted murderer. Some months ago he was paroled from the penitentiary at Canyon City and since then has been in several shooting scrapes. He was accused of robbing a stage and murdering the driver less than a week ago. Graham read the letter and called in his private secretary. McMurray, get Canyon City on the phone and find out if a man called David Sanders was released from the penitentiary there lately. If so, what was he in for? Describe the man to the warden, under twenty-five, tall, straight as an Indian, strongly built, looks at you level and steady, brown hair, steel-blue eyes do it now before he left the office that afternoon graham had before him a typewritten memorandum from his secretary covering the case of david sanders end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of gunsight pass how oil came to the cattle country and brought a new west by william mcleod rain this librivox recording is in the public domain three in consultation the grizzled railroad builder fixed sanders with an eye that had read into the soul of many a shirker and many a dishonest schemer how long have you been with the jackpot company not long only a few days how much stock do you own ten thousand shares how did you get it it was voted me by the directors for saving jackpot number three from an attack of steelman's men graham's gaze bored into the eyes of his caller he waited just a moment to give his question full emphasis. Mr. Sanders, what were you doing six months ago? I was serving time in the penitentiary, came the immediate, quiet retort. What for? For manslaughter. You didn't tell me this yesterday. No, it has no bearing on the value of the proposition I submitted to you, and I thought it might prejudice you against it. Have you been in any trouble since you left prison? dave hesitated the blazer of railroad trails rapped out a sharp explanatory question any shooting scrapes a man shot at me in malapi i was unarmed that all another man fired at me out at the jackpot i was unarmed then were you accused of holding up a stage robbing it and killing the driver 
No, I was twenty miles away at the time of the hold-up and have evidence to prove it. Then you were mentioned in connection with the robbery. If so, only by my enemies. One of the robbers was captured and made a full confession. He showed where the stolen gold was cached and it was recovered. The great man looked with chilly eyes at the young fellow standing in front of him. He had a sense of having been tricked and imposed upon. I have decided not to accept your proposition to cooperate with you in financing the jackpot company, Mr. Sanders. Horace Graham pressed an electric button and a clerk appeared. Show this gentleman out, Hervey. But Sanders stood his ground. Nobody could have guessed from his stolid imperturbability how much he was depressed at this unexpected failure. Do I understand that you are declining this loan because I am connected with it, Mr. Graham? I do not give a reason, sir. The loan does not appeal to me, the railroad builder said with chilly finality. It appealed to you yesterday, persisted Dave. But not today. Hervey, I will see Mr. Gates at once. Tell McMurray so. Reluctantly, Dave followed the clerk out of the room. He had been checkmated, but he did not know how. In some way, Steelman had got to the financier with this story that had damned the project. The new treasurer of the jackpot company was much distressed. If his connection with the company was going to have this effect, he must resign at once. He walked back to the hotel, and in the corridor of the Albany met a big bluff cattleman, the memory of whose kindness leaped across the years to warm his heart. "'You don't remember me, Mr. West?' The owner of the fifty-four quarter circle looked at the young man and gave a little whoop. "'Damn my skin, if it ain't the boy who bluffed the whole railroad system into letting him reload stock for me!' He hooked an arm under Dave's and led him straight to the bar. "'Where you been? What you doin'? Why didn't you come to see me soon as you got out of a job?' "'What do you have, boy?' Dave named Ginger Ale. They lifted glasses. "'How? How?' "'Now you tell me all about it,' said West presently, landing the way to a lounge seat in the mezzanine gallery. Sanders answered at first in monosyllables, but presently he found himself telling the story of his failure to enlist Horace Graham in the jackpot property as a backer. The cattleman began to rumple his hair, just as he had done years ago in moments of excitement. "'Wish I'd known, boy. I've been acquainted with Horace Graham ever since he ran a hardware store in Larimer Street.' And that's most thirty years ago. I'd have gone with you to see him. Maybe I can see him now. You can't change the facts, Mr. West. When he knew I was a convict, he threw the whole thing overboard. The voice of a page in the lobby rose in sing-song. Mr. Sanders! Mr. Sanders! Dave stepped to the railing and called down. I'm Mr. Sanders. Who wants me? A man near the desk waved a paper and shouted, "'Hello, Dave. News for you, son. I'll come up.' The speaker was Crawford. He shook hands with Dave and with West while he ejaculated his news in jets. "'I got it, son. Got it right here. Came back with the governor this morning. Called together pardon board. Here it is. Clean bill of health, son. Resolutions of regret for miscarriage of justice. Big story front pages afternoon papers.' Dave smiled sardonically. "'You're just a few hours late, Mr. Crawford. Graham turned us down cold this morning because I'm a penitentiary bird.' "'He did?' Crawford began to boil inside. "'Well, he can go right plumb to Yuma. Anybody so small as that.' "'Hold your horses, Em,' said West, smiling. "'Graham didn't know the facts.' If you was a capitalist and thinking of loaning big money to a man you found out had been in prison for manslaughter and that he had since been accused of robbing a stage and killing the driver. He was in a hurry, explained Dave, going east tomorrow. Someone must have got to him after I saw him. He made up his mind when I went back today. Well, Horace Graham ain't one of those who won't change his views for heaven, hell, and high water. All we've got to do is get to him and make him see the light, said West. "'When are we going to do all that?' asked Sanders. "'He's busy every minute of the time till he starts. "'He won't give us an appointment.' "'He'll see me. We're old friends,' predicted West, confidently. Crestfallen, he met the two officers of the jackpot company three hours later. "'Couldn't get to him. 
Sent word out he was sorry and how was Mrs. West and the children, but he was in conference and couldn't break away. Dave nodded. He had expected this and prepared for it. I found out he's going on the eight o'clock flyer. You going to be busy tomorrow, Mr. West? No, I got business at the stockyards, but I can put it off. Then I'll get tickets for Omaha on the flyer. Graham will take his private car. We'll break in and put this thing up to him. He was friendly to our proposition before he got the wrong slant on it. If he's open-minded, as Mr. West says he is, Crawford slapped an open hand on his thigh. Say, you get the best ideas, son. We'll do just that. I'll check up and make sure Graham's going on the flyer, said the young man. If we fall down, we'll lose only a day. Come back when we meet the night train. I reckon we won't have to get tickets clear through to Omaha. Fine and dandy, agreed West. We'll sure see Graham if we have to bust the door of his car. End of chapter 29《Chapter Thirty of Gunsight Pass: How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Flyer. West, his friends not in evidence, artfully waylaid Graham on his way to the private car. Hello, Henry B. Sorry I couldn't see you yesterday. The railroad builder told West as they shook hands. You taking this tram? Yes, sir. Got business takes me east. Drop in to see me sometime this morning, say about noon. You'll have lunch with me. Suits me. About noon, then, agreed West. The conspirators modified their plans to meet a new strategic situation. West was still of opinion that he had better use his card of entry to get his friends into the railroad builder's car, but he yielded to Dave's view that it would be wiser for the cattlemen to pave the way at luncheon. Graham's secretary ate lunch with the two old-timers, and the conversation threatened to get away from West and hover about financial conditions in New York. The cattleman brought it by awkward main force to the subject he had in mind. "'Say, Horace, I want to talk with you about a proposition that's on my chest,' he broke out. Graham helped himself to a lamb chop. "'Sail in, Henry B. You got me at your mercy.' At the first mention of the jackpot gusher, the financier raised a prohibitive hand. I've disposed of that matter. No use reopening it. But West stuck to his guns. I ain't aiming to try to change your mind on a matter of business, Horace. If you'll tell me that you turned down the proposition because it didn't look to you like there was money in it, I'll curl right up and not say another word. It doesn't matter why I turned it down. I have my reasons. It matters if you're doing an injustice to one of the finest young fellows I know, insisted the New Mexican staunchly. Meaning the convict? Call him that if you've a mind to. The governor pardoned him yesterday because another man confessed he did the killing for which Dave was convicted. The boy was railroaded through on false evidence. The railroad builder was a fair-minded man. He did not want to be unjust to anyone. At the same time, he was not one to jump easily from one view to another. I noticed something in the papers about a pardon, but I didn't know it was our young oil promoter. There are other rumors about him, too. A stage robbery, for instance, and a murder with it. He and M. Crawford ran down the robbers and got the money back. One of the robbers confessed. Dave hadn't a thing to do with the hold-up. There's a bad gang down in that country. Crawford and Sanders have been fighting them, so naturally they'll tell lies about them. Did you say this Sanders ran down one of the robbers? Yes. He didn't tell me that, said Graham thoughtfully. I liked the young fellow when I first saw him. He looked quiet and strong. A self-reliant fellow would be my guess. You bet he is, West laughed reminiscently. Let me tell you how I first met him. He told the story of how Dave had handled the stock shipment for him years before. Horace Graham nodded shrewdly. Exactly the way I had him sized up till I began investigating him. Well, let's hear the rest. What more do you know about him? The Albuquerque man told the other of Dave's conviction, of how he had educated himself in the penitentiary, of his return home and subsequent adventures there. There's a man back there, and the Pullman knows him like he was his own son. 
a straight man none better in this western country west concluded who is he Memerson crawford of the d bar lazy r ranch i've heard of him he's in the jackpot company too isn't he he's president of it if he says the company's right then it's right bring him to me west reported to his friends a large smile on the wrinkled face i got em going south boys come along em it's up to you now the big financier took one comprehensive look at emerson crawford and did not need any letter of recommendation a vigorous honesty spoke in the strong hand grip the genial smile the level steady eyes tell me about this young desperado you gentlemen are trying to saw off on me graham directed meeting the smile with another and offering cigars to his guests crawford told him he began with the story of the time sanders and hart had saved him from the house of his enemy into which he had been betrayed he related how the boy had pursued the men who stole his pinto and the reasoning which had led him to take it without process of law he told the true story of the killing of the young fellow's conviction of his attempt to hold a job in denver without concealing his past and of his busy week since returning to Malapi. All I've got to say is I hope my boy will grow up to be as good a man as Dave Sanders, the cattleman finished, and he turned over to Graham a copy of the findings of the pardon board, of the pardon, and of the newspapers containing an account of the affair with a review of the causes that had led to the miscarriage of justice. Now about your jackpot company, what do you figure as the daily output of the gusher? asked Graham. Don't know. It's a whale of a whale. Seems to have tapped a great lake of oil half a mile underground. My driller Burns figures it at from twenty to thirty thousand barrels a day. I can't even guess because I know so blame little about oil. Graham looked out of the window at the rushing landscape and tapped on the table with his fingertips absent mindedly. Presently he announced a decision crisply. If you'll leave your papers here, I'll look them over and let you know what I'll do. When I'm ready, I'll send McMurray forward to you. An hour later, the secretary announced to the three men in the Pullman the decision of his chief. Mr. Graham has instructed me to tell you, gentlemen, he'll look into your proposition. I am wiring an oil expert in Denver to return with you to Malapi. If his report is favorable, Mr. Graham will cooperate with you in developing the field. End of chapter 30